panel of nine leader providers from the area to address any questions that you might have. We do have some questions that have been uh, sent to us through registration. I do want to point out while we're talking about questions, um, if you are not comfortable raising your hand and asking a question, Angel has uh, index cards and pens. Just raise your hand so you can write it out and nobody will know where it came from because we'll shuffle them up and hand them up. So. With that said, um, obviously we wanted to choose the topic of Lyme because it is a very pervasive issue. Um, it is a, a disconcerting issue and it's also somewhat controversial. So um, the idea was to get people armed with as much information as possible and uh, we'll see how that goes. So I wanted to introduce our panel briefly uh, before we start and then we'll come back through and, and be a little more thorough. First is uh, Mary Penner is joining us. She's a nurse practitioner. She's joining us from Therapia in Brunswick, her practice there. We have Dr. Sean McCoy, who is an MD from um, in, I had it, Integrative Health Associates of Maine. Oh, <laughs> Integrative <laughs> Health Center of Maine. Sorry, I had that one in And 
Um, I finally, when they said we're going to send you for testing for ALS, and I said, no, you guys don't know what's wrong with me. I, I get it. I have all these symptoms. You're confused, but I don't believe that you know what's wrong with me. And that day I had a meltdown in the office, and the intern said, um, you know, you just need to accept what's going on. And I said, accept what? I can't accept what I don't know what I don't have. And none of these labels feel right to me. I had so many labels and so many treatment options. Nothing stuck. Nothing fit. And I said, why can't you send me to somebody to, about Lyme? My sister-in-law, for the better part of two years, kept saying, you sound like my friend who's been battling this disease for over 20 years. And I would look at her and I would say, Carol, I had four negative Lyme tests. Every time I bring it up in the office, they scream at me. So I said to the intern, why can't you send me to see somebody who knows about Lyme disease? And they said, A, we don't believe that's what you have. And B, um, you know, we don't want to play into this delusion that you have, that you think you have Lyme disease. So I just had a complete meltdown in his office, and he ripped off a piece of scrap paper and handed it to me, and it had the name Sarah and a phone number on it. And he said, give this person a call. I've heard that she sees Lyme patients. And then after you talk with her, come back to me, and we'll, we'll get back on track, and we'll get you tested for your ALS. I never went back to that office again because that doctor was Dr. Sarah Ackerley, and I saw her, and during those three hours, her intake and her clinical diagnosis on me revealed what she found to be was late-stage neurological Lyme. Um, she brought Dr. Leon Heck from Portsmouth into the equation. He did a lot of the blood tests. He ordered some extra scans. They discovered that in um, also, with having late-stage neurological Lyme, I also tested positive for uh, Babesia, Bartonella, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and Ehrlichiosis. And on that day, she reached across the table and she squeezed my hand and she said, you are very sick, but I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to be with you and we're going to try everything we can. And I said, how long is it going to take to get me better? She said, I have no idea, but we're not going to give up. And that memory has stayed with me, even though I was probably at my absolute lowest point cognitively, that memory stayed with me. And every time I refer somebody to a Lyme provider, no matter how many providers they have been to, I get a phone call, I get a hug, they're crying, and they said, that visit changed my life. So when I went into remission in April of 2014, I met Angel, Angel Rice, and we shared stories, and she had a very similar story. I got bitten as an adult, but she was bitten as a child. But we realized we had resources. We were grabbing resources from all over the state and putting them into one spot. And we realized that there were resources that were free. Information, financial, referrals to providers. There were providers all over the place, but they, nobody wanted to openly say, I treat Lyme, I believe you, I treat chronic Lyme disease. Nobody wanted to put it out there because of the controversy, because of the other doctors reporting them. So we slowly started grabbing all of these names, and in the past four and a half years, we've built up a network of over 200 Lyme litter providers throughout the entire state of Maine. And people can reach out to our organization. They can get a referral for free. You can visit the information at our table back there. We've got financial assistance programs. We just today got two people connected to treatment protocols. They have no income. They have been sick for years. They have zero income. There are programs that help those people get access to care. So that's part of the stuff that I do also on the federal task force side. My job is to bulldoze through all of these barriers. What is, what is the problem? Some of it's legislative, some of it is people just can't find these components. What are you looking for? A naturopathic doctor? Here you go. A DO? Here you go. Homeopath? Here you go. We have all of that information. And it's free and it's accessible and people can reach out anytime they want. So make sure you <laughs> Jeff, I don't think you need that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's just a little bit about me, my story, what I've been through, and uh, why we do what we do. We're active year round. Um, we don't get a day off because Lyme doesn't take a day off. Patients need us, patients find out about us, and you know, we're here to get them connected to people like this, people like Doug for testing people like these amazing doctors because these are the doctors that are not going to sit there and say you're crazy. You know, they might say you might need to see somebody because you've got a little bit too much stress going on in your life and that's okay, but they're not coming at you like you are crazy. And, um, 
you know, we believe in all that. We believe it takes a village to get somebody through this, and don't worry about how long it takes. Every patient is absolutely different. Everybody's going to present different. Everybody's going to react different to treatment. But our our mission is to let people know that you can get through this. If somebody tells you that you can't, just keep on walking because there are people that push through this when they get connected to the right resources. So thank you all for coming tonight. So, so we're going to just jump into this. These, I'm just going to read some questions and then we're just going to kind of go right down the, the road. And again, if any of you have a question or we're talking about something and something comes to mind, um, if you want to ask a question, if, you, if you're okay standing up and, and just talk extra loud so everybody can hear. So we're going to start off with something simple. How is Lyme disease transmitted? So, are we in that? Sure. Just, okay, so right. primarily through the deer tit, the Soviet scapulars uh, tit, and uh, the, the highest risk of transmission is with the nymph. The nymphs are also obviously the, the hardest to see, to find and attach. They're you know, smaller than the head of a pen. Um, there is evidence of, of vertical transmission as well, meaning from mother to fetus while in utero. So some folks refer to that as congenital Lyme disease. Uh, I've seen a number of those patients. Um, there are ways to prevent the sort of the transmission, that vertical transmission, but it usually requires the mother being on one or two antibiotics to pregnancy. Um, so those are the two ways that I uh, feel confident transmission occurs. I mean, there's talk of sexual transmission. I feel like I'm not totally convinced of that. Uh, I know there, there are a lot of couples, married couples, um, that both have it, but obviously they live in the same environment, they have the same exposure. So, um, I don't know, Dr. McCoy or Mary may have a different opinion about the sexual transmission, but at this point I'm not quite sure. I, I, um, I just, a couple other ticks to, to talk about too, the, the dog tick, the common people dog tick, does not give Lyme disease. But the, some of the co-infections um, or other illnesses may be carried by dog, I'm not sure about that yet. And we're just now in Maine starting to see Lone Star ticks, uh, which used to be out of Texas, but now it's all over in Maine. And they do carry some other uh, nasty diseases too, including really Lyme disease, probably. So, a couple of things that can, that can uh, transmit the infection. Um, I agree with Jacob. I think that the sexual transmission thing is, is a theoretical possibility. Um, they have isolated some DNA from spirochetes from things like tears and other bodily fluids. Um, I feel like if it were easy to transmit sexually, then we would have figured that out by now. Um, it's hard to study because if you have a, uh, say a married couple living somewhere and one person got Lyme disease and the other person doesn't, and say they live in Maine, if the person gets Lyme disease eventually, then come from the you know, sexual transmission or from sort of the So hard to say, really, um, but I don't think it's very easy to catch it sexually. Yeah, I agree with what was said. Um, I do have a patient, more than one actually, who got bit by a reflu spider and pretty much that was the beginning of all their Lyme symptoms. Now that they have it and that just put them over the edge because we know a lot of people can be positive and have no symptoms. So not 100% sure, but there are people out there and I, I don't think it's um, research that say that anything that binds their sting theoretically is positive, but that's, you know, who hasn't had a mosquito bite? <laughs> There, something I do want to add, it's not Lyme, but babesiosis being found in red blood cells, there can be concern about blood transfusions. And so Massachusetts, um, uh, the Red Cross now screens blood for babesiosis because who wants to receive transfusion and, and you know, also contract very serious um, infection as well. So that's something we might love. And Sean, you mentioned the, uh, the Lone Star tick. Um, I don't know about many of you in that along the way here. Um, nothing drives me more crazy than when I hear the media talk about a new tick that they discovered or a new disease. It irritates me. I want them to re, you know, to report factual information. So I reached out to my resource at the University of Maine Co-op Extension, uh, Senator Jim Dill, and I asked him one simple question. How long has the Lone Star Tick been here in Maine? And he said it was first discovered in 1990. So that tick has been living here for well over 20 years. Now, did it bring the disease with it at that time? I don't know, but it just shows how long we coexist with some of these ticks that we don't necessarily know about 
and it may not be a brand new something or other, but what we have discovered is once enough cases have been reported, now the media will put it out there as, as a half, uh, sort of a health concern. But I just would like to see them report it a little more accurately this, that we've been cohabitating with this tick since the early 90s. So. Right. Easy uh, it's, it's a parasitic infection, like a distant cousin to malaria, and it's, a, it's an infection that lives within the red blood cells. Um, and it's important to know if somebody has just Lyme or if they have mesiosis because the treatments are completely different. So it's, it's very crucial. Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a really common infection that is history. The question is, can babesiosis go into remission and then reappear? I mean, I'm in remission from it. Um, I use the word remission. I won't use the word cure. I know some people want to use the word cure. Just from what I've been taught, what I've been uh, privy to, the education, stuff like that, I know that on some cellular level it lives within me. And I know I can be reinfected. And I also know at any time it can flare up. So, yeah. I want to kind of circle that? back yep. back to basics yep. for uh, one area that's a little controversial. I think a lot of physicians are still passing out some, some inaccurate information around how long the tick has to be embedded in your skin before the diseases can be transmitted in your body. Um, so, so back to basics, the, the tick crawls onto you, it, it gets into your skin, and it begins to feed on your blood. That's what it, it does to, to the continuous life cycle. The infections we're talking about here, Lyme disease, Babesia, there's some viruses as well. Some of them will live inside the tick's stomach, and some of them live inside the tick's saliva glands. And uh, after a while, and a while is an area of controversy, but after a while, the tick will vomit the contents of the stomachs under your skin, and that's how the infections seem to get in for the most part. Uh, how long that takes is, is a little controversial. So, the uh, old school thinking was you had to have a tick in your skin for at least 24 hours before you get Lyme disease. Now we're seeing plenty of case reports of minutes to hours needed for that spiral feed, for that Lyme to get into the body. The uh, Powassan virus, which killed a famous artist in Maine a few years ago, uh, only needs 15 minutes to get into the skin. So um, if you see a, a practitioner, say you go to the ER for a tick bite, and say, oh, the tick was only for a few hours, you can't get Lyme disease that way. That is inaccurate. Um, so the, it, there's a lot of questions and not a lot of answers, unfortunately, when it comes to Lyme disease and the other associated diseases, we call them co-infections. Um, so you know, anybody who claims to have all the answers is, is lying. Uh, but we just need a lot more research is what it comes down to. But there are a lot of old schools of thought now that are um, gradually being uh, disproven. So that's one of them. You, you can only, you, the tick only needs to be in your skin for a few minutes for um, these diseases to be transmitted. Yeah, there's there's ample evidence for the Babesia and Plasma Lipia. And, and I was listening to an NPR show in New Hampshire, and the CDC reps said very clearly that in a Plasma or Lipia, the Babesia could be transmitted within minutes. But if you go ask the primary care doc in that state about that, they have no clue. I think there is, there's a disconnect. I think the education needs to, yeah, needs to come forward down. Yeah. Yeah. And Maine is a is an endemic state. I mean, we keep rocketing back and forth between position number one and position number two. So our medical providers need to be on the forefront of all of this. They need to be up to speed um, with what's going on. And that's why you get a lot of varying information. You go to your primary or you go to the ER or you then get referred to a, a, a line or a provider. And, and people say, well, why are we being told so many different things? Well. You know, who you see matters. Who you see for your care is going to matter. It's like if you get cancer, you see a cancer specialist. If you suspect a tick-borne disease, you want to see somebody that understands this disease inside and out, because um, most doctors don't. And that's where the, the, the very, um, that one. Um, how is Lyme diagnosed? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doug talk. Well, since I'm, I'm not a clinician, but uh, thank you. <laughs> so at IHNX, that's pretty much all that company does is, is do uh, treat and actually diagnose Lyme disease. And treat. Um, so there's various different tests that are out here to actually diagnose it. There's indirect testing and direct testing. Indirect testing is to actually, when you go looking for the bug, um, Lyme disease or Bartonella or Babesia or the, the disease, 
you're actually looking for it either using PCR or dish testing, they call it. So you're looking for the DNA. Um, it's kind of like OJ Simpson. You're looking for, <coughs> you're looking for the glove. If, if they find the DNA, then that's usually the telltale sign that you have it. The, the biggest thing is a lot of doctors, a lot of infectious disease doctors may say, well, that could be living DNA and that could be dead DNA. So that's, a, that's an issue that they can take up. Now they can also look for your RNA, and RNA is your building blocks of, uh, basically RNA is the transcription and translation. It's basically writing the chapters. It's, I kind of say it's the Gutenberg press. It keeps building more and more DNA, and then sends it out so then it or builds the DNA and has to come on, builds the proteins. So, um, if you if we find it in the RNA, that is living. That's 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 living bug right there, and no clinical pathologist is going to argue with that. So, the problem is these bugs are very elusive. So trying to find them directly is a challenge. So then, we, our Western blot test is the quintessential test to really look at to see if a patient has developed the antibodies in your body when a Take first bites you, it's like you, you were saying before, it's, it's regurgitating it's some fluids into your body, into your skin, into your bloodstream, and then your body will develop these antibodies four to six weeks later. And that's what we're testing. We're testing the Western block test, to test for your immune body's response to see if you develop those antibodies. The problem is when someone gets really sick, their immune system gets suppressed down and they may not be able to even elicit that immunological response. So the testing gets a little felt down. And our company has a, a new immunoblock test, which is a little bit more comprehensive um, at picking up Lyme disease. It's more of a panel approach. And then there's what's the latest is we're looking at T cells, we're testing the T cells. So T cells live four to six weeks. Uh, on average, uh, usually right around four weeks, your T cells will die out. Um, and it doesn't matter how sick you are, it's so long as uh, even your, your sickest uh, cancer patients out there will still develop T cells. So your T cells will live four to six weeks. That's an early response that we're able to pick that up before your body develops the antibodies. So that's kind of how we're looking at it. <laughs> So how is it getting missed so much? It's getting missed so much because this, like I said, this bug is highly elusive. What they found is this Borreliosis, which is the whole encompassing of all the many different strains. They've now discovered there's over 300 forms of Borrelia worldwide. Most of them are zoonotic or animal form. Uh, 37 of them actually are harmful to humans. We're finding nine are here in the United States, but we keep finding more. So that's the problem when physicians are saying, well, we, we ran a Western blot test and it came back negative. Well, we're only looking for a few, few strains. It could be one of these strains that we don't know much about yet. And so it's going to be negative because we're not looking for it. So that's the, that's the issue. We don't know what we, we don't know. So, and the other thing is what Dr. Stevenson's group developed or discovered at the University of Kentucky in 2002 is what they call forearm sensing. This bug simply, it coils up like a snake in, in different forms and it folds over onto itself and it changes its outer surface proteins. So what it does is uh, your body can't, your body's immune response can't recognize it and then it goes into remission and creates a biofilm around it to protect the patient. So it's highly elusive, and then when it, it can come out years later, unfold on itself, it looks completely different to your immune system. Your immune system doesn't recognize it, so it elicits a different response. So it's it's very tricky, and it, it's what we're thinking, what our uh, Dr. Shaw at our lab says is this graph, it's, it's almost like we're in 1982 with the HIV crisis, where we just don't know enough we need more research to try and figure all this out. We need states and federal government and, and health agencies working together to try and figure this out. It's a crisis, it's an epidemic. And it's not just here in the United States, it's in Russia, it's in Siberia, it's in all these other countries. 
being in northern Finland, where we thought ticks could never survive in the winter, they're there. Um, so it's a, it's a massive problem, it's a global problem that we need to, we need to address. And uh, I think the, the testing is getting better, but we, just, we still haven't developed a test that can say, yes, you have it, or no, you don't have it anymore. We're just not there yet. So what's the name of the best test for somebody that's in the if, if you're looking for a, an initial screen, there's the Western Block Test by Agenis, um, which we still stand by as to be considered one of the best tests. And then the next level up, the next generation, is our new Immuno Block Test, which is basically our Western Block Test, but it's the next generation. It's the new, it just came out in November, so it's looking at more, it's more fine tuned. Um, and then we have the IGX spot test, which tests your T cells. Like I was saying it's the earlier response. It's called a spot test? It's, it's called the IGX There's spot information test. up front here. You can grab handouts about that as well. Yeah, so I've got little flyers that we can test here. So, so. so that's not the CD. So. No, the CD is 57. Sean, do you want to address yeah. the ELISA test? Well, I wanted to make, make one point. If, if you all forget everything we say to me, <laughs> with your own balls information. The single most important point that I can make tonight is that the diagnosis of Lyme disease, what we call a clinical diagnosis. What I mean by that is, if you have all the symptoms of Lyme disease and a good story, got bit by a tick, got sick, I'm still sick, and you have all these symptoms, and I've listed them all in the handout I'm gonna give you, and you can rule out the other diseases that cause those same symptoms, you probably have Lyme disease. It doesn't matter what the test says, positive or negative. Uh, one, one of the problems that Doug mentions is the false negative rate of these tests is so high. False negative means tests that you don't have the disease when you actually do have the disease. So as a clinician, I don't really rely on the tests that often. If I get a positive test, yay, it's a confirmation, it's helpful. But if, if I actually use my brain and talk to the patient and listen to the patient uh, and, and the story fits and I can move on the other stuff that causes those symptoms, I don't really care about the testing. Um, so the classic symptoms are, um, you know, uh, muscle pain and joint pain that moves around in your body, sweats, fatigue, cognitive symptoms are common, brain fog, memory loss, things like that. Um, that's that's Lyme disease usually, unless you can rule out that the cause of it. So there are 38 other symptoms that go along with Lyme with co-infections. And like I said, I listed them all in the handout here. Um, so if you check off these boxes and you got 36 out of 38. And you know you got bit by a tick, and you know I don't really care what the test says. Um, the, the the tick bite itself is a problem too because the nips are so darn small. So who can see the size of a pinhead, you know, on, on your skin for a few hours? So um, less than forty percent of Lyme disease patients remember a tick bite. Um, most people never remember a tick bite. Um, less than fifty percent have a rash. So we talk about that bullseye rash. You don't have to have a rash to get Lyme disease. Um, so the, the testing is great and the, and the newest generations are better. I think um, Doug was telling me that this new generation of immunoblots are 90% sensitive or so. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that one in 10 people will have a false negative. So that's better than the standard testing, which is around 50%. Uh, possible point, you know. So that's my big point is, is that Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. You don't need the testing to be positive to be diagnosed. Can I go ahead? Just one quick irrelevant sort of question. Are the strains varied around the region, around the world, by region? Yes, there's uh, there's some strains. Uh, our new immunoblock test is actually inclusive of two strains that have been mostly found in, in Eastern Europe, but we're actually seeing them here in the United States now a whole lot more because we have melting pot of people who travel around and family members. So it's, there's also a, a strain uh, called Borrelia neomotoi, which is actually not Lyme disease, it's, it's tick-borne relapsing fever, so we have to do a separate test. Um, it's looking for apples instead of oranges type of thing. And that is, is really a big concern because uh, your, your average tick will transmit 20, maybe 30% of the time, actually have the, the, the disease on pass it, pass down from, from the mom. And with, uh, with Borrelia pneumotoid, we're finding it's much higher, 57, even 80%, we're not sure. But so it's going to be the next that we're all concerned about. So we're, we're concerned that 
clinicians will start doing a testing for Lyme and saying it's not Lyme, but it's relapsing fever, and they don't know that. They need better, need better education. And last year, we, we sent uh, a mom and her small child to one of the Lyme pediatricians in the state because their, their local pediatrician kept saying, the Lyme test is negative, the Lyme test is negative, and then they ran the test for the relapsing fever, and she was positive. So again, it's seeing a provider that has that extra knowledge about what's going on and recognizes the symptoms and either knows what to look for for treating, or as Sean said, we'll just come right out and treat. But the, the, the differences can be so subtle that the, the provider orders the wrong test because they don't know any different, comes back negative. Now, if that mother did not uh, you know, get told from friends and family to keep seeking it out, they would have gone home with the child and just remained sick. So, you know. I'd like to add one last thing, um, kind of adding to what Dr. McCoy said. Uh, so if you get a tick bite and you are symptomatic and you go to your PCP and they test you with an ELISA within the first few weeks, it's almost always going to be negative. So don't accept the doctor telling you you have Lyme disease because you probably do. So that's where the clinical diagnosis is really critical. But most patients don't take the time to know what your symptoms are and to come to that conclusion. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my biggest issues is hearing from uh, support groups, the line support groups, and from emergency room physicians saying, well, a patient came in over the weekend, they were just hit by a tick, so I took the test. It's going to be negative. They haven't developed the antibodies yet. This is basic medicine. Have you, don't you remember immunology 101? And what a great segue to a clinical trial that I'm running in my practice. Yes. So uh, I'm looking for volunteers uh, who've been bitten by ticks. Um, there's a company, Oxford Immunotech, who's developing a new test that they're trying to detect the DNA, the other biomarkers that are in a person's body within hours or days of a tick bite. Um, and so we're looking for people who've been bitten by ticks. It's four blood draws. You get paid to be in the study. It's $225 to get paid. Um, so come take a flyer if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> That's a good condition. <laughs> and you mentioned that you can actually have a tick tested, and sometimes I find that really helpful. We have a tick kit that's from neuroscience, and it tests for the growth and infections. And that's helpful while you're waiting those two weeks that people get really nervous about mm -hmm. what am I going to do and they freak out. Which, you know, all that cortisol I think makes one <laughs> <line> worse. <laughs> where, how do you bring it up? And I'm going to. Well, I'm just going to piggyback off that and let y'all know There's that some other June, testing too, but. June 22nd, the University of Maine opens up their, they have an open house at their new tick lab. Mm -hmm. The one that we voted in several years ago and right. paid thousands and millions of dollars to have it. So right, right now, um, you know, if you send your tick away, most of the time you send it down to Amherst Mass, the tick report, um, they have a sensitivity rate of like 99.99%. So you're going to know within three business days what pathogens that tick was carrying. Um, again, though, we've had people send the tick off. They come back with their the email and they go to their primary and say, "I've been exposed to this," and they get told, "Well, if you're not symptomatic, come back to me when you're sick." Oh. Um, most and you guys can talk to this. I mean, most Lyme providers don't do that wait and see type thing. So you guys want to speak to that, but mark that down. We'll have that on our information. Um, on our website, June 22nd, when the new tick lab in Maine opens, and we'll make sure to get that spread out across the state so people know about that. Do you know the chart? Um, I checked with them on the testing. Like with Massachusetts right now, they get, uh, it's either free or $15, where it costs everybody else like $50. So when I spoke to them at the University of Maine, they hadn't quite yet established what the first year would be. It'll either be free or it'll be $10, $15. Um, but it's always good to know, especially if you're not symptomatic right away, it's good to know what you've been exposed to, because um, that can really cut through to the chase. Um, so what, what is your guys' take on the, the wait and see? I don't like to be wait and see, it, particularly when they come in with a bull yeah. rash and the you know, symptoms. I don't wait and see. And even if they don't have symptoms and they, they have a pretty good tick yeah. bite, I'll just treat you guys. Way better to do the four or five weeks of antibiotics than four to five years, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Current well, guidelines are 21 days of doxycycline, 200 milligrams twice a day. If you're still symptomatic, you lose 21 days, you keep on treating until you get better. Uh, if you're a child under the age of 80, you don't want to use tetracycline, so use Augmentin instead. There are many, many other options as well. But 
I wrote all that down a little bit, so the handout along okay. with the um, a tape lab. Oh, the um, the local lab where they just do the mic disease do you know? Oh, for fifteen everything. bucks. Yep, everything. Oh, cool. They do the same thing that Tip Report is doing, but right. so we've been waiting all these yeah. years to get our own lab up and running. So yeah. So, so they're already doing like lots then. Everything. Last report, that's we've got yeah. 14 species of ticks that are identified, and we've got all the different uh, diseases that are identified. So they will be checking not only that, but they will also be because they're connected to tick report and they're connected to the federal. So as things start popping up, like uh, the Asian tick and the Heartland tick and all those things they're carrying, it'll go on their radar screen. Even if those ticks are not here yet, they will be on the radar screen. So when somebody from Maine sends in. Uh, their tick to be tested. There's, there's online questions that you have to answer, you know, if you travel anywhere or whatever. And they will go through all of the major things that, we, that are known to be here in Maine and then things that they suspect that are coming in this way. So even if you don't check off anything, they're going to let you know what that tick was carrying. So it'll go against a state database and a federal database. Yes? Is anyone on the panel aware of a line literate doctor who accepts Maine <laughs> My daughter was a certain way yeah. that falls from the Medicare doctor saying, yeah. the DHS will not cover the line. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of Medicare accepting doctors, but when Medicare will not cover No, there were two doctors, and then they stopped taking the insurance, basically because Medicare just would not reimburse them for anything. I mean, Medicare reimburses most providers at the bare minimum, and they just were not getting reimbursed enough. And so they dropped taking main care. Um, but we do recognize that as an access to getting care services. So that is something that is being looked at at a federal level. That the state funded or the state insurances have to do more than just the bare minimum, especially in endemic regions. They, they've got to raise that up. So, how about the, um, how about the there are about financial that? resources for people who don't have insurance or whose insurances won't cover. So we can talk to you more about that afterwards and also get you connected some information. So the first thing is they'll ask you, do you have insurance? And if you have it, then they'll try to bounce it off your insurance and whatever your insurance doesn't cover, then they go to the next layer and go from there. But there's lots of federal programs that will then step in and help people pay for visits and also testing in for treatment. So so, uh, so I see a number of sliding scale patients mm -hmm. and some of the, and a number of free patients. Yeah. So if you wanted to have your daughter call our office, I'd be happy yeah. to speak with her to see if it's something we could work out. And there's a there's an organization called Line Tap, L Y M E T A P dot com, and uh, it's basically like tuition assistance program type of thing. So if you qualify, it'll help pay for testing. Uh, supplements, co-pays, if you even need a ride back and forth to the, to the doctor's office, it will help pay for that. So it, it's a much better service that, that our company provides, so we, we help, help fund that. And there are some financial programs that are geared just for children, there's some for young adults, and there's some that don't have an age restriction whatsoever. So there's lots of them out there, and, and a lot of them are on our website. There's far more than what we have on paper, but that just gets people started. So the next question, we got three different types of providers. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Um, what are the doctor's thoughts on the CDP data? I know it's controversial in some report, some are expensive. I'm just curious. So the question being asked is what are the doctor's thoughts on the CD57 test? Okay. I, <laughs> thought, I, um, I don't order, order them as often as I used to. A couple years back at ILADS, one of the presenters commented um, on testing, you know, the same person multiple times in a day and how much you fluctuate within a day, as much as 30 to 40 percent. So, if that's the difference between somebody having a CD57 of 60 and 100, that would sort of affect, it would influence your clinical decision making as a provider. Um, but I still do it if I don't have clear evidence or if somebody's not responding the way that I would expect, I don't have a positive cluster blot, I may still do it. But if somebody's in sort of if it's kind of in a gray area, it's, it's not all that useful, but if somebody has a CD57 of 15, that's pretty useful. I was going to ask, are there, are there numbers that you're like, oh, wow, well, that's yeah, like mine I mean, was 41 and I was clinically diagnosed? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty low. Okay. Yeah, but if you're like in the 7,500 range, it's a little bit less clear. If it's yeah. 200, it's like, wow, that, you know, yeah. most likely they come. So that's mm -hmm. my personal. Yeah. 
So for those who aren't familiar, the CD57 is a specific type of white blood cell called a natural killer cell. And uh, one of the many ways that Lyme is so smart is that it suppresses our immune system. So it turns off your body's ability to make this type of, of white blood cell. And we have pretty accurate ways of measuring how many of those cells you have. Uh, so back in the old days, maybe 10, 15 years ago, when we first discovered it, it was like, hey, all right, we've got a sort of indirect way of, of seeing if Lyme is present or not. But I totally agree with, uh, with Jacob. He says that over the years, we've had more data come out around the test itself. There are other co infections that can also suppress the CD57 count, um, and then things like HIV and mold toxicity and things like that as well. So I used to order it quite often, but I don't really use it at all, all that often anymore, unless I really need some kind of objective data saying something going on here to make my test of last resort, you could say. But I don't rely on it. We also used to use it to, to measure progress over time to see are you getting better? Is the treatment working? But because of the massive fluctuations, we don't really rely on it as much anymore. We're also seeing a one year gap between um, getting better, no more line, and a normalization of the second count. I was at the same lunch recently. Yeah. 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 And it's kind of hard to tell somebody, oh, your CD57 is fine, and they feel horrible. So, you know, you have to correlate. Yeah. Yeah. We also, I had this conversation with the patient this morning, we come from a from a place where we go to the doctors and they run a test and the test tells them what's wrong with us and then they go to the computer, the computer tells them how, how to treat us. And that's sort of what we're conditioned to. We're conditioned to, we need to have a test in order for our doctor to understand what's going on with us. And I have so many conversations with people that when I say, well, when you get matched with the right line provider, if that's what they think you have, Go for it. You know, if you want to pay the money to have the test, if they need to have a test done to rule something in or rule it out, if you start treatment and somewhere along the way something flares up and you think we need to rule it or rule out a co infection, those are individual conversations to have with those providers. But at some point, you have to trust your provider and just check in with them at every visit. And I mean, once with my own personal journey, once we did all the testing up front, we didn't do a lot of testing along the way. We just kind of kept feeding the beast. So to speak, in every visit, we're like, okay, we're, which one are we feeding this time? And eventually things got better. So then we started doing some testing, as um, Shauna alluded to, to, to see, to kind of measure, just so we had it on record, how, you know, what my progress was. But with the testing right now, so faulty and unreliable at the time, sorry, Ben. Um, you know, if, if you put all your eggs in that basket, you can go walking out. Like Mary said, the test says you're fine, but you feel like, you know, so at some point you have to kind of say, let's have this conversation, let's talk about this, you know, and, and trust the line provider. That's, I can't say that enough, you have to trust them. You may have been through 10 different doctors that failed you or called you names or wrote bad things in your medical report. You have to trust your line doctor. You really have to. And, and it, some things may sound kind of quirky or you may say, well, what does that mean? Or you know, you just kind of have kind of to trust, and that's the most important advice I can give you, is just trust the journey and trust that they will stay with you along the journey. And it might be a little rocky, but eventually it'll smooth its way out. So. How is Lyme treated? Hmm. And I know we've got three different treating providers here. Do you want to start with that one, Mary? How do you treat your Lyme patients? Well, let's start with, um, it's not like taking two doctors. <laughs> <laughs> that that's one of the myths. And I think there's multiple ways to treat one and multiple ways to get better. And so I'm sure y'all have a different approach and it doesn't mean that one of them will really work. I do tell my patients though that I think both of us have to agree that this is the right, it has to feel right for both of us. Because if one of us, like if you say I have to have a blouse and I don't think in, in your case that would be the right thing, it won't work. So you need to find someone who who you can um, talk over the treatment with and, and make it work. Because sometimes I'll refer to someone else because I think, you know, I think their approach is going to suit you better. Um, I don't use a lot of antibiotics actually, um, and I do use a lot of ozone, and we can talk about ozone a lot, but I mean, that's one of the things we use. I use a lot of the calorie protocol um, and other herbal therapies. And I don't treat always just Lyme. I feel like if you're just treating Lyme, you don't always get better because there's usually a lot of things that are out of balance and everything has to be addressed. And I know I've, I've said this before, I have nothing to do with Red Dr. Bredesen's book on the end of Alzheimer's where he talks about if there's a roof with 36 holes in it and you plug two of them, you're not going to get great results. 
And that's exactly how I've always felt. A list of things that really should be addressed before you're going to totally get better. So if you just focus on life and its co-infections, you may not get great results until everything is addressed. Yeah, pretty similar. So I'm, I'm the medical director of the Integrative Healthcare Center of Being. Integrative medicine means we combine the regular old conventional allopathic pharmaceutical driven medicine with the natural holistic um, alternative medicine and we just do it all at, at, under one roof and really it's what works for that human being in front of us. Um, so I do use antibiotics, um, oral, IV, uh, oral IV antibiotics if needed. Uh, I use a lot of natural protocols as well. Um, for me as a physician, my rule is first do no harm. So I wanna make sure that whatever I use, whether it's a natural or conventional treatment, it's not gonna hurt the patient, it makes sense to me scientifically. It's got some evidence in the, in the literature. People have tried it before. It's worked. Um, and it's portable, too. So regardless of what path I choose or what path the patient chooses, as they say in Buddhism, there are many paths to the moon. So everybody has to find their own path to get to where they want to go. Um, but that, for me, that, that's the key. It's like Mary was saying. It's an integrative approach, a holistic approach that not only treats the infection, but helps the person heal from the inside out and get better from this illness. Um, and I could go on for hours and hours from the various options that I do, but the natural <laughs> protocols are um, Calvin protocol, Dr. Shane protocol, Byron White protocol, and the Buna protocol is the natural that I use. I just have to say <laughs> real quick, I, I feel like even if you had uh, the same Borrelia and co-infections as the next person, yours might present totally different. So every person that walks in the door to me is a completely different disease. I don't even, I mean, I know, look at the co-infections, but because of your genetic makeup or the way you methylate, it's going to be completely different, maybe a different treatment. I think something you'll hear from all of us is we have a lot of different tools because each person responds to different, differently to every treatment approach we may have. And, um, I agree completely with Mary. I, I have to feel very confident that the patient and I are on the same page because if, if I think antibiotics would be best with the patient's sort of you know, questioning it, kind of reticent about it, um, I have to find out respond nearly as well as they would with the plan that they feel comfortable with. And is that just placebo? I don't know. Or is it, um, you know, the power of the sort of the therapeutic relationship and the patient feeling hurt? Um, but, you know, I think any, any Lyme practitioner who's been doing this for a while has a ton of different tools because that's what it takes to treat a private people. And, you know, if there's a provider where all they use is antibiotics, there's going to be a fairly high percentage of people that they're probably not going to get better for a number of different reasons. Um, and as Mary said, you know, looking at all those downstream effects, the, the, the more chronic an infection has been, you really have to look at hormones, um, you know, gut health, uh, endocrine, or yeah, that is, uh, hormones, um, you know, the cognitive piece. I mean, there's so many different components that you really have to address concurrently for someone to ultimately get well. So, without getting into specifics, because that can take hours and hours. Yeah, that's okay. What complicates treatment? That's a good question. I mean, I really think fear is one of the biggest complications of treatment and anxiety over um, what's going to happen. I know one of the patients that I diagnosed with Lyme, and I told her, you know, your test is positive, and she and her husband burst into tears. I, you would have thought I told you she was going to uh, cancer in the next week. It took a couple hours actually. Um, but once they understood that that was actually a good thing that we knew what we were treating and what was going on, that she was lucky that we actually got a positive test. <laughs> you know, she did really, really well. So I think that fear is one of the things. I mean, there's lots of things that are complicated, but you know, not addressing all those different pieces of the puzzle too. I just wanted to add on to, um, a couple of weeks, about a month ago, I was at a, a conference and listened to Dr. Tom Moorcroft, who's um, on Eyelids, uh, and he's been talking about, uh, he gave the little thing saying how when he was diagnosed with Lyme, went, to, went through a whole different, bunch of different doctors and didn't really know what it was, and he said they were calling it idiopathic syndrome. <laughs> And he said, as a clinician, he said, when a doctor actually says you have something that's idiopathic, it's idiot doctor. <laughs> so it was his polite way of saying that. Um, but I just want to mention that, that um, 
When you go to see a line of literary physician, they are the modern day Sherlock Holmes now. They are the most resilient clinicians that I have uh, ever met, and they will leave no stone unturned. They'll look for everything. They're, they really, they thrive at, they love what they do, and they really want to focus and, and help one patient at a time. And uh, that's what it takes. It's, uh, but I think you're in the best chance to get some of the brightest ones here in the state and, and do your allowances. So. We're speaking with um, physicians in, in the area and lab, thank you. Um, what, what, what do we have in our resources around us to keep our mental health while we're going through this? Because those are some serious symptoms that yeah. are included in that and that we are doing the work. Yeah. How do we work in mother and partner and all of that? So, uh, mental health providers. In our practice, we have a line literate uh, social worker who has his own experience with Lyme disease, incredibly knowledgeable. And so I, I've heard great things about the work he's doing with patients who are you know, working through Lyme disease. His name's David Aronson, so he's someone you could reach out to. He also trains mental health professionals. He's so set up. That's, I guess this is my question, is are there any more? Oh or yeah, or he's, like, he's, oh, he's, he's doing his second training this year. The first one had like 30 other providers in Portland. He's doing one in Augusta. He's traveling to Massachusetts to do one. So, um, so it's, it's huge, because I think a lot of people miss the mental health component. Yes. Um, and, and knowing that, you know, if you look at uh, Sean's um, symptom sheet here, I mean, depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia can be some of the primary physical symptoms, and if you have a mental health provider that doesn't know that, um, you could be honest. Or connect them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. I think that's super important, but I, I mean, and, not but. Sure. <clears throat> I use a little questionnaire from Pyro Gloria. If you want to Google that, it's on, you can find it online. But especially with young kids that have Lyme and they have terrible anxiety, if that test is positive and you treat them with the methylated B6 and things, it's an amazing turnaround. Mm -hmm. So I always want to um, differentiate between is this just a deficiency or a methylation issue? It's causing this horrible anxiety. I'm an adult too. I do everyone now. Everyone who walks through the door just quickly does that. And it, I have seen a huge difference. So if you can take down the anxiety with supporting the body, that's huge. I mean, counseling is huge too. I'm not putting it down. You need to help, I think. And that's what I try to differentiate. One quick little addendum to that is that in children, Lyme disease often presents first as behavioral changes and mental health issues. The, the kids don't get the sore, he can't do anything the muscle and the fatigue. They, they change their behavior, their school goes awry, yeah. something changes in their inner core personality all of a sudden. But in one month, um, honestly, yeah. several kids around the 10, 12 year old that just completely flipped on their parents. I mean, they would have been drugged for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So that to me is just a treatment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And so just yeah. don't leave any still in here. Yeah. I just want to add to me. My name is Deborah Presser. I'm a naturopathic doctor and a homeopath. I work with Dr. McCloy at Integrated Health Center of Maine. And in the beginning, Paul, you mentioned homeopathy. And I think homeopathy is another really important tool for helping mental illness. And again, I could talk for hours about that. But basically, it's a kind of medicine that works to stimulate your own innate healing ability. Also, we have an integrated psychiatrist on staff at our, our office as well. Thank you. Yes, I have a question about homeopathy. What do you guys mm -hmm. think about Leo? I always keep it on hand just in case there's a tick bite, and I treat all tick bites ASAP, um, but I just want to get thoughts. Lido Palustri is a homeopathic remedy that you know. Oh, the, the question is what, what do we think about Lido? It's a homeopathic remedy, and uh, it can't hurt, but probably help. I recommend it too. I tried to use Chinese healing oil from systemic formulations first on the bite. I mean, people want to just that was another try that question first. I had. Is there anything you can put on the light? Yeah. Or, wait, can I use that? What so, about China? Do you want to try that? Mm -hmm. What about bentonite? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that powerful? Do you want to try that? Yeah. 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 Ye
we get a lot of calls over the weekend when the doctor's offices are closed and people are struggling, like, do I go to the ER? What do I do? We just took a tick off. I mean, especially in the summertime, you get people that are coming up, maybe they're camping or whatever. And so that's almost our go-to thing because we've seen so many providers say it and we, we let them know we're not doctors, but it's safe enough to use the letum and the Benonite clay to pull out this off the, the surface toxins, top of the Benadryl to lower the histamine reaction, and then get them to the nearest walk-in clinic or live or provider that's open on the weekend just to kind of assess and always keep the tick, don't throw the tick away. Are there any recommended um, herbs? I'm a sure combo that I like a lot called Biocidin. It's a liquid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tincture that has a bunch of different antimicrobials in it. And you can take orally, you can apply it tonically as well. Um, there's another one called the Vibrant Light Formula. That's all it's a homeopathic and herbal combination. You can apply that topically too and take light. Um, so, uh, alcohol as, uh, as uh, to, yeah. to treat. Um, I would not recommend putting alcohol while the tick is on your skin. Uh, or any other kind of irritant to the tick. You don't want to burn it with a match or put alcohol or rub it with Vaseline or any of those things because it irritates the tick itself and they will, it's more likely to regurgitate the contents under the skin. After it's been removed, um, alcohol may help a little bit with being an antimicrobial. So again, it couldn't hurt. L-A-D-U-9. And there was something going around on the internet that many people have seen about putting peppermint essential oil on around the tick and they will naturally back out and that is true but not before they regurgitate their stomach contents into your body so again the idea is don't irritate the tick you don't want further exposure to whatever pathogens are in their stomach um, and there are easier ways to get the tick off of you in a safe and effective manner one easy way is to use a tick spoon i got some door prizes so question to the audience question to the audience what was the first known case of lyme disease <laughs> I don't think we Ever in history, in human history. Years ago. Oh, close. 2,000 years ago. 5,000. Closer? Closer? <laughs> Anybody do you know who it was 5,000 years ago? Yes, man. You got it. Very good. 5,000 years ago, close to the ice man. Uh, was the guy that they found in the glacier in Germany, and he uh, they, they isolated uh, Borrelia burgdorferi DNA from him, and he had Lyme in his knee and was treating himself with um, acupuncture needles, actually, and tattooed his ankle at uh, acupuncture spots that we still use these days for arthritis. So, wow. uh, that goes home to the Lyme Connecticut 1970 idea. Yeah, what about the Long Island lab was? Yeah. And what about we, the tick keys? The tick keys? Those are good too. Yep, yep. Um, I, I when, when tweezers. In terms of removal, yeah. tweezers. Yeah. Tweezers are good. Yep. You want to, you want to pull the tick straight out of the skin. You don't want to twist it. Um, and when you when you get under the tick, you kind of gently gently pull. Give it a minute, a full sixty seconds, a minute, and gentle traction. Don't yank it out, but a minute because it takes a while for it to let go of its mouth parts, and then you can pull it out. Now it's impossible to two year old, right? But if you've got the time and, and the wherewithal to kind of get under it, pull up with tweezers or tick stone or tick key. Yeah. So say again? Does it break the head off? Uh, well, if you pull too hard, it'll break the head off, right? But give that gentle traction, the head will, will <laughs> let go, this mouth will let go, and you'll pull yeah. the whole thing out. Yeah. Get a magnifying glass and make sure you've got yes. all the little parts, uh, because the head does have the salivary glands that has Lyme and other co-infections too. If the head is still in there, then get a sterilized needle, try to dig it out the best you can, or go to the ER. Um, so try to get all those parts out and then just treat it like getting a wound, put some antibiotic ointment on it, put a band-aid on it, for the best. We hear from a lot of patients that say they go to the ER and the doctor says, just leave it in there, treat it like a splinter, your body will eventually reject it and work its way out. We look at that like the cork in the wine bottle. So if there was any, any infection on the outer part of those barbs and it went into your body, they're plugged in there. So no, you don't. If you if that ever happens to you and it breaks off, get it all out. Demand that they get it out. They got surgical tools. They can use whatever it takes to get it out. Don't don't leave it in there. And wait for your body to reject it. So, and paralysis can also result from leaving the head in. So that's right. a good reason to do it. Paralysis is right. Yeah, the saliva can cause the paralytic. Um, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I had a question about in the treatment of Lyme, um, maybe more in um, my mind about. Um, uh, how, how are you seeing for um, working with um, more toxicity? Because that seems to be um, the kind of the symbiotic relationship there's something like that. 
Yeah, I, I followed um, Dr. Richard Horowitz's protocols quite often. He wrote a couple of brilliant books. Uh, the first book was um, Why Can't I Get Better? And one was How Can I Get Better? And he goes through his, I think it's a 16 point differential diagnosis list, and mold toxicity is on there, candida overgrowth is on there, head metals, Mary mentioned, uh, hormonal imbalances, inflammation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of family doctors and PCPs don't want to touch Lyme disease because it's really complicated. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of um, stamina to get through it together with the patient. And you've got to go through all those little 16 things and work it all up and get through it. So if you look at the list of mold toxicity, there's a lot of overlap between Lyme symptoms and mold symptoms. A lot of overlap between candida and mold symptoms. Um, so you just got to figure it out. And, 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 and as far as um, mold in a person's home, mm -hmm. uh, especially somebody with Lyme, how it will take them down, other people in the home are completely unaffected. Mm -hmm. Is this something that, that you um, have to do with in your practice? Do all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 25 percent of people have a genetic susceptibility to it, and not being able to detox the mycotoxins. So you can do it's called HLA-BR testing to see if they have that susceptibility. Um, I don't know if it gets covered by insurance. I think it's pretty pricey. That's something you can find. Yeah. What's the result of that? Well, first, remove exposure. Yeah. So if the home is, you know, has water damage and mold, I mean, remediation can be incredibly expensive and not effective. Again, without heavy the house. And if you can't afford it, yeah. You can call the mold specialist to come and try to yeah. see if they can, so, you know, remove them. But it it's pretty costly. You can try to remediate, but yeah. it's not, it's often not helpful. Yeah. That's just the unfortunate reality yeah. of it. If that mold, if mold produces toxins and your body can't get rid of those toxins, you can't get better until you get the toxins out. Right? Are the mold kits that you can get over the internet effective for finding out if you're... Yeah, How do you know which one Like you, you go to the hardware store and get a little petri dish kind of test, is that what you're talking about? Mold, right. mold test, you put out a little cat yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're okay. Um, if, if it's positive, it's helpful, but they're often negative because you have to, if you work with a, if you want to do an ERMI test, it's what like environmental or maybe relative moldiness index. And basically, they have this equipment, it's like, it's like a blower where they get the fan that blows the spores across the grow medium um, and, they, and they capture on these biochips. It's $700 to do that. Um, but that's a much better assay of the air quality and they also do, they also do surface testing. So if you go to micrometrics.com, you can actually purchase a kit. It's, it's an attachment that goes on the vacuum and you can vacuum up old dust, which has mold, spores, mycotoxins in it. Then you can send it out to micrometrics and then they'll test it. And then your physician or you can do a consult with them to learn about the different mold species, what they can indicate in terms of the current uh, damage, past damage, severity of, of the water damage. Certain species are normal in the environment, some are normal indoor, others are obviously not. So, my question is something. But like from that. what I understand, at least you have someone come to your home to test the store, well, you don't want them to take a sick, you don't want a company who also remediates the problem. Right, exactly. I think there are, law, there are statutes against that actually uh, these days. The same company cannot be. So, this is the same as mold allergies. If yeah. children and adults are diagnosed with allergies to mold? Similar to that, yeah. So, so you can have either an allergic response, which is the sneezing, the watery, itchy eyes, kind of like pollen allergy, um, or you can have this more severe toxic yeah. deal over where, where the, the mold spores produce a chemical, a toxin, that accumulates in your body, builds up over time, and damages your body. That's not an allergy, that's a toxic reaction. And something to keep in mind too is molds can colonize mucous membranes as well. So sometimes the treatment involves antifungals, either the sinuses, nasal passages, the gut. So even if you remove exposure, sometimes there's persistent mycotoxin production that you also have to address as well. Uh, we have a patient right now who is uh, the culture as we're dealing with their sinuses. So we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but just to be clear, how long should a person be treated acute versus chronic? So if somebody comes into your office and they just had a tick bite, just had the bullseye, versus someone who thinks that they may have been exposed for a while. I treat till they don't have symptoms. I treat for six to eight weeks after they're asymptomatic. I continue treatment before pulling away. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, it's as long as it takes is really the best answer. What are some common concerns that you find with your patients as providers? What, what are some of the concerns that you have that you're seeing from your patients? I think that what they've been told in other offices and made me feel like they're really stupid. Mm -hmm. I, I could write a book about it. Yeah. It's really yeah. sad. Call it, no, you're not stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. not all good. Um, I, I mean, the financial piece is a big concern for almost everyone, so I feel like a good chunk of many of my visits is coordinating how folks can actually pay for testing and treatment and follow-ups, and the last thing I want is for somebody to spend all of their money just to see me and then they can't do treatment or they spend all their money on treatment and then they're lost to follow-up because then I have no idea what's, what's going on, so the financial piece for, you know, at least 75% of people is, is a big concern that comes up. These ones are... are Kind of common. What other tick-borne diseases are you treating in your office, and how often do you find colon infections? Pretty often for me. I think in the, in the Northeast, uh, Babesia is right up there. Uh, Ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis. Uh, there are what, I think 65 pathogens now that are found in, in the in the deer ticks here in the North uh, the Northeast. That's the time right, you guys, mm -hmm. including the viruses yeah. and everything else. Um, so yeah, well, whatever patient's got. And one of the nice things about like BioSide and some of the herbal formulas is we don't always know what we're treating. So being able to have a broad spectrum approach that'll treat viruses, bacteria, and protozoa would be really nice. For as antibiotics, we just treat bacteria. And if we don't really know what we're treating, it's nice to have that broader, broader approach. I've been seeing tons of parasites lately. I don't know about you guys. Gastrointestinal. Oh my God. People bring in pictures, and the other person just this week brought in a jar of them. Yeah. So, yeah. But until you really get rid of parasites, it's really hard to get rid of them because fire feeds can go in and out. So we kind of shifted to lots of parasites. Yeah, it's sort of an emerging field. The, the yeah. last ILAD, ILADS, the, the, the acronym we put up, it's International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. Uh, so the conference this, uh, this past February, they were talking a lot about anti-parasitic regimens. Even if the patient doesn't test positive for parasites, if they're sort of stuck on a plateau, they're not really getting better, you've treated the uh, Lyme, you've treated co-infections, you really try to help heal, then a lot of clinicians are just putting them empirically on an anti-parasitic medicine, uh, pharmaceutical or natural, and that really kind of gets them into the home and they get to the heal. So it's, it's an emerging field. Any, many more questions about that? So we talked about mold toxin. What other health concerns typically arise with tick-borne diseases like EB? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I will do a whole viral panel, EBV, Parvo, CMV, sometimes Coxsackie, um, HHV6, sometimes we'll do H HSV1 and 2, mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, um, the list kind of goes on and on. There's so many other sort of infections to check that may or may not be carried by ticks, but that can become chronic and can really um, complicate um, and, and prevent someone from ultimately healing if they aren't addressed. So, yeah. The candida seems to be huge. And sometimes once you treat that, all the symptoms go away. So it's like a lot of symptoms like that are the same as one. You know, the brain fog, the joint pains, fatigue. For me, the heavy metal set is an X factor sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have some lead or mercury or other um, background exposures to metals. They, they haven't been poisoned, they haven't worked in a factory, but they're exposed to little bits all the time until they reach a toxic level and you throw the toxin of the wine, the toxin of the mold, and all these other pieces of junk in their body, and they feel terrible. So again, if I have someone who's kind of stuck on, on a plateau, I'll often do some heavy metal testing that's um, seven pounds of that stuff. What, what are common lifestyle changes that you recommend to your patients and why? Food is the best medicine, yeah. right? Food is the best medicine. So I immediately put all my patients on an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, I have sort of a, a, a one, one page sheet of that. It's, it's, it's whole food. It's eating mostly plants. It's eating clean food, minimizing your sugar, minimizing your easy carbohydrates, no processed foods. Uh, so really cleaning up the diet, I think, is, is a one immediate change that I always advocate. Uh, exercise is really good for everybody, including Lyme disease people. Uh, mind body approaches, so some mindfulness, some meditation, uh, approaching the spiritual aspect of their healing is important for me too. 
And Recipes for Repair is a great cookbook based off the Lyme inflammation diet. I tell every new patient to get that book. Yes. I, recipes for Repair. Recipes for Repair. Yep. So it's based on the Lyme inflammation diet. Uh, Ken Singleton, I think, was the MD who wrote a book and came up with the diet, and then this cookbook is based purely really off of that, that diet. So it's really great because it gives you some recipe ideas. You definitely water. Um, if you don't drink enough water, you're not flushing out toxins. And and most of the human mind is getting out of toxins. And deep breathing, anything to do with uh, actually all of those things have to do with getting out of toxins. Yeah, yeah. Well, and in normalizing digestion, that you sure somebody's having a regular full bowel movement every day, because we do get rid of a lot through bowel movements, so that's also critical. And skin, so you can do dry skin brushing, saunas, hydrotherapy. Contrasts, hydrotherapy, the shower, turn into cold, and it's cold. Sleep. Restorative sleep. One of the quotes I remember from my lab was that one of the physicians said, I will walk a thousand miles to make sure my patient sleeps because it's so helpful. Yeah, sure. So what do you do when you get pushback from, from patients who don't want to stop with the gluten or don't understand why cutting out the refined sugar is so pertinent to their treatment protocol? I mean, sometimes I'll maybe be a little trash about it and tell people, you know, there's no point in wasting your money seeing me and doing the rest of this if you're not going to make some of the basic lifestyle changes. Um, and for some folks, it's immediate. They get that plan and, you know, day one or that weekend, they create a meal plan, they go to the grocery store, they're ready to go. Some people, it's three months or six months later. So people come to their own time. I'm lucky to work with a really big team of, of practitioners. There's 16 of us now in practice. And, uh, we have a health coach. We have a certified behavior analyst. Um, so it really is a nice way uh, of the tools in the toolbox to help people to take step-by-step -step approaches towards their healing path. And so we, we take the you know baby steps or, or whatever side step they want to take, but um, it, it's hard. It's hard to make those, those basic changes when you're used to um, eating a certain way your whole life and you've got a job and kids and there's no time to do anything, you no time to take care of yourself. How do you make those changes that are really fundamental? So, um, so some of our health coaches can help with those kinds of so are you going to say that generally you can't get well through wine unless you give up um, meat and sugar? I would say that's a, that's a very that's a very general statement, but I, I would agree with that general statement. I think for me, sugar, sugar is poison, right? You got to get rid. And by sugar, I mean, of course, the sweets and the junky stuff, but also um, the pasta and the and the bread and the crackers and all the easy carbohydrates that turn quickly into sugar in the bloodstream. Uh, and a lot of these pathogens, they love sugar. Yeast loves to eat sugar. So, they, and, and, and one, here's a really cool fact. Canada, one of these big fungus, lives in our gut. It produces a neuropeptide that crosses the gut blood barrier and then the blood brain barrier and talks to the hypothalamus in our brain. This little protein made by this bug down here talks to our brain and turns on our cravings for sugar because it wants sugar. So we're like zombies walking around, feed me, feed me sugar, and we want to feed those bugs. So the bugs are making us do things, right? So that's why. It's like, so the <laughs> the first protocol with most of the patients, we start with the gut and try to reduce that. And, and I, you know, I tell them, if you do this, it's going to be so much easier the rest of the time. So it is a bit of sugar. There is a bit of um, molecular mimicry, I think, with gluten too. And, and the expired piece um, toxins. And so you don't want to add to that mix. And I don't know, what I, once I explain that to patients, most of them, I'd say 95% are pretty much on board, they're going to try, and then you try to help them. But seriously, if you want to get better, and most people do, half the people that come in are like, I'll do whatever. You say. Yeah. I'm going to so sick. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. a little bit of both. Yeah. 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 wanted a referral to a wine provider and we gave it to him and he came back the second month and he said, I need another name of a different wine provider. And I said, 
why I gave you the, the best name possible. And he said, because they demanded that I give up sugar and gluten free. He goes, so give me the name of another doctor. So I said, okay. So I gave him the name of another doctor and I said, but listen, they're all going to tell you the same thing. <laughs> they're not in this room. I'll tell you that. Three times he came back to me before he finally, with the third time, I said, okay, listen, I'm going to give you the third name. I said, do me a favor, stay with this provider for three months. And if you don't like them, I would personally reimburse you. Just stay with them for three months. He stayed with them. He did what they said to do. And now he's kind of like the reform smoker at the table. He now tells everybody at the meetings why you need to cut out gluten and sugar. And he is also in remission. So he needed to give it time. And he was like, I'm not giving up coffee. I'm not giving it. He gave it all up. And one of the things we tell people in our support meetings is give it a full year in treatment. It doesn't have to be forever, but we find that when they try to bring it back in, they don't want it now, or they have an adverse reaction to it. So give it up while you're in treatment. Give your body a fighting chance to absorb the treatment that, you know, give it a healthy playing field. And then if you, you know, go into remission and you want to try to factor it back in, go for it. But I guarantee you probably won't want it back in your system again. Alcohol is another one. Most yeah. people cannot tolerate alcohol yeah. at all if they have Lyme disease, and so that's enough incentive right there. You feel miserable after yeah. one glass of wine, so yeah. Not about smoking. Yeah. No, smoke all you want. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to kind of work with where they're at right. and steer them in the right direction. Find yeah. that path. What about giving your body more alkaline? So alkalinizing is, is often important too. The, the anti-inflammatory diet, that recipe is a very excellent resource. Um, so there's this acid base or acid alkaline balance that we all exist in. A lot of chronic illnesses will put us into a mildly acidic state. Uh, and so eating foods that are going to alkalinize our body are often helpful. Um, and lion discarpy is not like an alkaline environment, it likes acid. So, that, that helps. So, so sugar is really acidic, and alcohol, and gluten, and wheat, so they come from all of this. Are they acidic? Yeah. Or are they so, the yeah, yeah, they yeah, they yeah. Yeah. yeah, they actually help. They, they yeah. alkalize the body. They're mild acid, but they help to alkalize the body. Because okay, you don't have to make as much acid to go that way. So, so I put one to one in my water. That's okay. okay. You want to avoid oranges because of the sugar content in oranges, but all of the citrus are okay. Mm -hmm. and the alpha cells are gold that people are familiar with. That's mm -hmm. very optimizing. Not regular alpha cells are gold. No, gold. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I'm going to find it at CVS. They have it here. They have it here. Yeah. <laughs> they, they carry it, I think, for that very reason. They promised to keep it. Yeah. What's that? They promised to keep it. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. What are the cards with the little stars on them? Uh, oh, those are the ones that were uh, submitted by registrants. Gotcha. Okay. So, what diseases can be confused with Lyme? For example, fibromyalgia, MS, and how do you differentiate? Rheumatoid arthritis is another one. I've had three or four patients who have 20 plus year diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, and with diagnosing, treating tick Lyme, bone infections, Lyme disease, removing gluten, nightshades for some. For one or two people is me, completely asymptomatic, mom with chimera, mom with methotrexate, prednisone. So all along was it misdiagnosis, probably. Um, so RA, other autoimmunity like yeah, MS, Parkinson's, can be confused, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, anxiety. I'm sure the list is I go ahead and treat anyway. I mean, yeah. I mean when they come in with a diagnosis of MS. <clears throat> but and the neurologist still says they have MS, so their symptoms are gone. So I don't really care what they call as long as they feel good and can function. Doesn't matter. And how many patients have actually come to you thinking that they had Lyme 
can only find out that that's not what they had. They had one of these other diseases. Usually, when their symptoms are that similar, the treatment for Lyme, I mean, not necessarily drugs, but everything else that we do for Lyme, really diminishes or improves the other diagnosis. So I'm not always 100% sure that it wasn't Lyme or was. I think one has to be careful to put on what I call Lyme blinders, where you start blaming every single thing on Lyme disease. And you, and you have to also, as a clinician, um, think about the differential diagnosis and what else could it be. Sometimes depression is just depression. Uh, and so you, you have to be careful about that. Lyme is now known as the great mimicker because it mimics all these other illnesses. Um, and it's one of the things that makes it so challenging to diagnose because it's, it's different for every single person that has it. So that's good to know because I know a lot of patients that I've spoken to have said when talking to their primary, when they say to them, I'm going to go see a Lyme literate provider, they get told, oh, they tell everybody that they have Lyme disease. So that's good to know that even if somebody comes to you guys under the, the pretense of maybe I have it, that like you said, you take those blinders off and you either rule it in or rule it out, but you still treat it here regardless. Are you hearing from patients who need stronger medicine and are desperate for pain relief? Um, I, you know, pain, pain is a part of Lyme disease. Uh, I try to avoid using opioids and medicines like that for pain relief. I find that uh, if I'm treating the underlying root cause of an illness, that the symptoms will go away and get better. Um, so I, I rarely use opioids in my practice. Um, I've been slowly using more uh, medical cannabis in the practice, kind of looking more and more into research behind that. So there's some pain relief aspects to CBD oils and things like that. Um, but for me, it's about inflammation. If I can turn off the inflammation, put out the fire, uh, using foods, using nutraceuticals, uh, very rarely I use pharmaceuticals for that, then um, then I, you know, we don't need the opioids. Um, we have a lot of concerns about side effects because we have power medications. I have really good results with doing prolozone injections in the joints um, for pain and that. It's really, even in the tissue, where there's just a, a muscle tightness, and then using um, our physical therapist, who does a lot of duties, that seems to work a lot for me. I know I keep plugging clinical trials in my practice, but we're really looking at the science behind this stuff. Uh, I'm doing a, another trial on this UV light therapy that's given as an IV. So the ultraviolet light will kill spirochetes, and viruses, and fungus, etc. The machine also produces a couple of other wavelengths that will turn off inflammation and improve energy production. So the trial we're doing is actually the chronic fatigue syndrome, but again, lots of overlap here. Uh, so please take a flyer for interested to learn more about that. I'll, I'll stick around afterwards and then I'll, I'll be all that and to answer any questions. Not only bringing it down at night time, but it's sort of improving cortisol production during the day, so you have that diurnal variation with it. I mean, there's a million different things to do for sleep. Sleep hygiene is obviously the first thing, so perfectly quiet. Uh, or, well, some people like to have some white noise, but um, dark, you know, 63, 65 degrees, put your screens away hours beforehand. You know, I mean, there's so much you can do for sleep. Cortisol is, is a concern. I like phosphatidylserine, PS, a lot of phosphatidylserine for, for turning off the cortisol tap there. Cortisol manager has that plus some herbals. What's that mean? Cortisol manager. Didn't do the trade. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, so that's I, got, Maybe, I had six yeah. years of insomnia. And they tried everything. They even gave me medication that they give people post surgery. And the pharmacy even questioned it while filling it because it was like four times. I took it and I was still awake. Nothing could knock me out. We tried everything. I tried combinations of things, even though they say never do it. I was so desperate to try to get sleep. And then um, I met a uh, salesperson at one of the uh, Lyme events, and he has graciously donated some boxes of Labella up here in front. And I will tell you, that is the only thing that did it for me. I had my Lyme doctor giving me tryptophan, Wide awake. I pulled it all night for the whole weekend. I was wide awake up cleaning the house. I mean, 
things that would normally knock people out, I had the opposite effect. They could not get my cortisol levels under control. It was just insane. The stuff that I was taking should have had me in a coma. And I would just take it and you would not even know that I took it. I started taking this Lavella. And I thought, well, it was, you know, it was designed for anxiety. It was designed to kind of calm things down. And it says take one to two pills. And he says, well, if you need to take a third one, on the first night I took two and nothing happened, and the second night I took three, it's, it's a natural lavender formula. I had tried melatonin. I had tried valerian root. I tried them together. I tried everything. Second night I took three pills and I slept seven hours. The third night I took three pills and I slept, I think, 10 hours. I know from my husband. Um, I have been taking that now faithfully for probably the better part of two years, two pills every night, and I sleep. I do not know. No. There's samples right here. Yeah. <laughs> you do not you do not get the groggy hangover feeling sorry when you charge it forward. Well the important thing is finding something that works and not having that hangover. I would also advocate uh, medical hypnotherapy. Uh, so working on those mind-body connections, uh, seeing a, a skilled hypnotherapist who is a blind living hypnotherapist, very helpful for sleep, great for pain, really all the symptoms of Lyme can respond to employing your inner healing ability. Uh, hypnotherapy is really good for that. Did you have any success with medical marijuana for sleep? Sure. Again, it's very different. Yeah. 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 We've got yeah. varying ratios of CBD and THC and it's not a very cure, but it helps with some people. Mm -hmm. For some lot. women who have no progesterone, and you know progesterone, sure. it starts creating yeah, sure. a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. But I you know, just wanted to try a lot of different things. What has your experience been with the medical establishment of a medical providers with regards to treating my patients? I would say it's mixed, but it's okay. I, I often tell patients, you know, when you send them to a, a specialist, particularly, don't start out by saying, I'm fine. Just let them analyze your symptoms and, and try to give you their best, you know, just to rule things out without that bias. And I find I get a lot better results. But, um, yeah, it's mixed. Have you seen a rise in chronic illness? That's all I'm treating that at all. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Can I, can I kind of spin on yeah. that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you think that that is because chronic illness is more prevalent or people are like tired and looking for answers in the right places or in those that are now looking at why is this such an important I think it's both, yeah. I think our environment reduces chronic uh, disease. And unless you're really in our culture, our culture, our, our environment, our lifestyle, but even things that you can't control contribute to it. So unless you're really intentional, you're likely to have something that's not. Yeah, people are tired of that. They don't know why they're so sick. And I know for us, with the events that we do, just bringing the awareness um, of, of chronic Lyme, we're finding people are reaching out to us that have been sick for 10, 15, 20 years. They've been told you have to live this way. And now you're seeing it in the newspapers, you're seeing it on TV, people are talking about it, it's out there, it's on the front burner. So people that have been sick for quite a while and think I just have to live this way, suddenly they're realizing I don't have to live this way. So now they reach out and they reach out to a provider. And we always tell people, you're gonna get worse before you get better when you start treatment. We just kind of prepare them for that. So I'm seeing a lot more people coming out of the woods, but I'm also seeing a lot more people recovering from this. So and don't be discouraged if you don't get well. Great. It didn't take you two days to get that way. No. Uh, so so yeah. you guys have covered a lot of things like yeast and mold and heavy metals. But what do you think about EMFs? I didn't hear that. Last time. EMFs. So, is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just try it. What do we do about EMFs, electromagnetic yes. frequencies? So yes. cell phone signals and smart meters. Wi-Fi. Actually, Dr. Warcroft speaks a lot about that. I yeah. heard him speak in Connecticut. I mean, and he talks about the things that he has gotten rid of in his house, yeah. even to the point how he tips his bed a certain degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of different things that he's done studies on that have shown to interfere with sleep. And if you can reduce that or at least shut things off, you know, I, it's funny, I used to laugh at my mother because she would shut everything off and unplug stuff, and now I think there's actually something to it, well, you know? Well, did Dr. Kelly 
Kevin, he said something in the last conference about how spire peaks they thrive mm -hmm. when they're, you know, when they're yeah, yeah. 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 being stimulated. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, in many areas, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so, uh, you yeah, know, I think play, playing it safe makes a lot of sense and unplugging as much as you can for lots of reasons. That's one cool. of them. I read an article from like 2014 reporting on um, cell phone use in mothers while the baby's in utero and actually finding higher ADHD, ADHD rates and things like that. It was an initial study, but we're seeing, yeah, we're actually seeing evidence that it, yeah, you know, part of it. So. I just came back from a cancer conference recently and um, they spoke, uh, two, two research, researchers spoke about cancer in the environment and how many nettles are in the environment that we're getting by osmosis, how many chemicals are born, babies are born these days, mm -hmm. about 100, mm -hmm. yeah. coming well, out of the pool. Yeah. I think I agree too, I mean, at, like, the cell phone manufacturers tell you you shouldn't hold the phone closer than like six inches to your ear, but who really it says, that? It says it says it a little thing it says right there because wow. it's known that you shouldn't yeah. do that, but everybody, <laughs> and I don't, I notice my ear starts to warm up, my jaw mm -hmm. warms up if I ever have my phone near, near my body, so I try to keep it away from um, okay, so the last two questions. Once Lyme is successfully treated, can it return? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so we use this term remission, right? So uh, I think it's probably impossible to eliminate every single last pyrochete and parasite and virus and fungus in our human bodies. We, we live with these things all the time. Uh, so the more evidence is emerging now around this issue of the biofilm, the sort of force field that the lime will, will produce around itself to protect itself from your immune system, and it will change its shape into a, this cystic structure, which is not an active spirochete anymore, but it's a little egg, a little cocoon that sits there for months or years or decades, and eventually hatches when you're stressed, when your immune system is down, when you have other infections that happen, and then it wakes up again and causes another infection. So I think remission is a really good term to use. Um, I don't really use the term cure anymore because I'm not convinced that anybody can cure anybody with Lyme disease. But, um, but for me, the, the, the end point of therapy is, do you feel good? Do you feel kind of bad to your baseline health before you got sick? Um, and, and then we stop therapy and then two, three months later, do you still feel good? Or do you, have you had any relapses? If you've had a relapse, okay, you still have something going on, you can treat again. Um, but if you feel good and you are happy and keep eating the anti-inflammatory diet and keep exercising and keep doing mind body work, um, because when you fall off the wagon, um, then your immune system gets a little weaker and that gives the bugs a chance to pick up again. I just tell my patients not to wait for months after you start feeling bad. If you do something right away, you may only have to treat for a month when you have a little relapse. You know, you got really stressed, somebody died, whatever. If you do something quickly, you usually don't have to do it for as long as you did the first time. So don't wait. And I'd like to just reiterate the importance of taking all the precautions so you don't get bitten again. Oh, get another strain of Lyme or even the same strain of Lyme and you don't develop immunity to it. So you have to always be sort of vigilant and careful with exposure. Yeah. Oh, it was? Yeah. Hey, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's all about uh, wellness. Um, the, a lot of, I have, have this one clinician tell me, it's that right now we're not in the, the healthcare system, it's really um, broken. And uh, it's, it's disease there. So really, you can go to see the doctor with a symptom, they'll fix that and on the go out the door. They run a script and say, okay, you're in the way. We, the way healthcare is set up, it's not a path to wellness. It's kind of like when your car breaks down, you go see the mechanic. When your body breaks down, you go see the physician. Well, it's, we need to actually make sure that our there they were well and they were eating well. And Food is is fuel and energy and investment, so it's it's starting there. Um, having that mindset, and so many different things. And there's environmental factors, there's genetic factors um, that we all have to take into consideration too. Um, but, but yeah, but about prevention too. Um, Dr. Uh, Moorcroft was mentioning uh, one of the preventative measures that he uses is for his own family is this honey birch farms. It's a spray you can get off Amazon. I'm not sure if Steve has it here or not, but mm -hmm. um, they may have something like that. I know you've talked about picaroting as a preventative measure. Do um, you want to talk about that? Now? Sure, yeah. So, prevention is the best way to not get a disease, right? So, 
um, I, I, on my hand that I put a little, a, a little spiel about this here, but basically, um, when you're outside, uh, if you want to wear light colored clothing, it's easier to see the ticks. You want to tuck your pant legs into your socks. And if you're really careful, you got to tape around the socks so they can't get down into the socks. Uh, do your tick checks every single day. So every single square inch of your body where the sun don't shine, that's where they like to go. So check those spots. Um, I like to avoid carcinogens with me and with my kids and my family. So I like Picoridin. Picoridin, they have it over the table there. Um, it's a lotion or a spray. It lasts about 12 hours and it's as effective as DEET, but not carcinogenic. It's safe for pregnant women and for young kids. And it won't melt the plastic, so it won't melt your cell phones and your, and your nylon gear, etc. That's what I use when I'm outside all day long, is, is pick a ride. Um, Permethrin yeah. is stuff that you can treat clothes with. So pick you can, the there's pick a ride. Uh, L.L. Bean, Cabela's, there's other uh, manufacturers that sell clothing that, that's been impregnated with permethrin. It lasts for 70 washings or so, and it kills ticks on contact. It's a blast. To, for me to go for a hike and watch a tick crawl on my leg and then stop and just die and fall off my leg uh, within a minute or two of exposure. So I like permethrin a lot. Once it's um, cured, once the chemical is cured up, it's not neurotoxic anymore. So if you buy clothing that's been pre treated, it's not going to harm you. Um, but you can also buy the actual chemical. I do not recommend doing that because there have been a lot of uh, case reports of toxic, toxic exposure, accidental exposures with people using it in their washing machines or trying to treat their own clothing and they get too much of this neurotoxin in their body and they get sick. So buy the pre-treated stuff or this company in North Carolina where you can mail your own clothes off and they can treat it for $10 per item and get it lasts for 70 washings. So I like the permethrin as well. Um, if you're looking for a totally synthetic chemical free option, there's the spray that Doug mentioned, there's other sprays too. I like this one, Amberman's spray. Um, it's got a combination of um, cedar oils and citronella, rosemary, lavender, there's about eight things here that all are repellent to bugs, including mosquitoes and ticks. And I will add some oil of lemon eucalyptus into this bottle. This has been studied by the CDC, again, non carcinogenic, as effective as DEET, if not more so. Um, and the, the downside of these kinds of volatile oils is they don't last for so they last for maybe an hour or two before they evaporate and go away. So you have to keep reapplying them all the time if you're outside for a long time. It's not a hassle. But they're safe. They're safe for pets, safe for kids, safe for pregnant women. Um, and then talking about EMFs, this is a good EMF. This is called a Zero Bug Zone Tag. It's a little credit card with a magnetic strip, like your regular credit card, that emits a frequency that is repellent to ticks and mosquitoes and chiggers. Um, so you can wear it in your, in your pocket or around a little cord around your neck um, and, it, and it keeps the bugs off of you. It sounded totally bogus to me when I first read about this, um, but the University of Texas did a placebo-controlled study with it. Definitely effective. I started using it myself. I use it on my dog. Definitely helps. Um, not 100%, it's about 92% effective according to the studies. But I like this as a nice chemical-free option as well. Safe for kids too. I've started to treat my own property with tick tubes. Tick tubes are cardboard tubes that are toilet paper roll stuffed with cotton and soaked with permethrin. Um, and they've done some good quality studies in these tick tubes. So you, you eventually, it takes years, but you eventually reduce the tick population on your property. Um, so that's another option too. I'm making my own, you can buy them on, 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 on retail. And uh, PVC. Like, that's, right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, they, they like the, so the way the tick tubes work is like the mice and the chipmunks and the little rodents that are really the, the vectors for the ear ticks, they love that cotton because they, they line their nests with it. And the cotton is soaked in the chemical, so they, they coat their own fur with that chemical, and that kills the deer ticks and the nymphs and the larvae that are on them. Um, but it takes a while to, to see results with that. So great to put around your wood pot. Yeah. Can you get mice feeding <coughs> stations for America? Mice feeding stations, coat coating the feeding stations with this with the permethrin. Well, I don't know what they, what's in. Okay, yeah, they, they do make these tick boxes now. It's like a, it's a box that lasts for two or three years, and the same concept. The animal goes in, gets coated with the chemical, feeds and uh, feeds whatever food you're putting there, leaves it, and they take the chemical back to the nest, and it kills the ticks in the nest. We have information on our website and also on our trifolds. When we travel around the state and do our prevention talks, we cover the five points, and Sean covered most of them. We always talk about wearing repellent, your choice of repellent on your skin. Um, people ask us, you know, what, what is the best repellent? And it's what, whatever works for you. 
um, whether you choose DEET or you choose a, a natural essential oil recipe, um, you know, whatever is working for you, keep using it. Definitely treat the clothing. Talk to your vet about your pets. Uh, we notice that vets tend to do seasonal treatment for dogs. The tick problem in Maine is a year-round problem. Ticks were reported in December, January, February, even in between all those nor'easters. So you need to talk about year-round treatment. And if you have a dog that's got a skin condition or they have a health issues, maybe you've got a really young dog or you an older dog, on our table, Dog Not Gone is one of our community partners, and Julie Swain actually makes the vests that you can wear on your dog. They are pre-treated with the permethrin that lasts through 70 washes. The chemical does not get on your pet, but it, it um, helps kill ticks. Um, we also talk about uh, treating your home and your yard. Um, as Sean was talking about the tick tubes, sometimes people just don't have time to go out there and treat their yard. So you can get in touch with, through the links on our website, the pest control companies. They can come out and they can offer you all types of options, anywhere from uh, chemical options to natural and organic options that work for you. And with the home, most of us clean our home anyways. There's a lot of cleaning products that have the eucalyptus, lemon, grass, uh, rosemary oils in them. Those do natural repellents as well. So keep it, you know, the, the state doesn't have a plan right now to, to eradicate the ticks, so it has to be individualized. You have to do what's right for your family. Some people talk about guinea hens, that's great. I personally are terrified of them. <laughs> they are loud and they come after you, but um, you know what, they work. And the turkeys work, but they also bring ticks in with them. So, you know, we live in Maine, we need to enjoy being in the great outdoors. And if you want the wildlife to come through your yard, that's fine. You just need to make sure that you're gonna put up all the berries that are gonna kill ticks so if they fall off on the wild of coming through. But I, I don't want to do anything to deter the deer from coming through my yard. I just want to make sure that if the ticks fall off, they die when they're in my yard. <laughs> and there's a lot of plants you can plant. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. list of over 10 or 12. Oh, yeah, yeah, natural um, things. Garlic yeah. is one thing they hate. You can plant yeah. that in the woods. There's a wild garlic. Yeah. Um, there's sweet grass that's mm -hmm. beautiful. And yeah. marigolds, a bunch of things that yeah. ticks don't want. Just make sure that whatever you're gonna do, whatever you're gonna put out there, always double check and check the, the safetyness for children and pets. You know, a lot of times people say, well, this works. Tea tree oil works. Well, it does, but you should not put it on children. And you definitely don't wanna put it on pets. So what works for adults does not always work for children and pets, but we've actually learned the hard way. We've had people speak at some of our events and they were just sobbing. They put the wrong oils on their pets and the, the, the dogs had organ failure. So just because it's safe and works for adults, double check before you apply anything to children and um, animals, especially your yard if they're gonna come into contact. But there's options, that's the biggest takeaway message is you have options. Doing nothing, you will have a tick encounter. That is guaranteed. Do you know about cystus and cannas tea? Have you heard that one before? Mm -hmm. So cystus and cannas tea, uh, yeah. uh, rock rose yeah. is the nickname for it. It's a tea that you can drink yeah. um, that's been clinically studied in humans. Mm -hmm. Four to five cups a day will dissolve biofilms. Yeah. Um, and will whiten your teeth because your teeth get yellow because of the wild films. You can use the discarded tea leaves um, in your pet's food as well, and your, and your pets will begin to exude whatever chemical it is in the cystus that is repellent to ticks and mosquitoes. So if you start drinking that tea all day long, no more mosquito bites, no more tick bites. It's called cystus, uh, C I S T U S. It has a kind of mild rose flavor to it. Rock rose is the nickname rock for it, Mediterranean rock rose. Get it off of the internet. So we're going to be wrapping this up. I just want to check to see if we have any last minute questions. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and then open it up and you guys can come up and talk to the panel or help yourself to any of the handouts. Yes. No other questions? I want to thank all of you thank because you it was 75 time. degrees out there. It was a beautiful spring <laughs> evening. Yeah. And you decided to come here with us and blather <laughs> on for two hours. So I'm going to teach you all one special stretch for my line of patient. Special stretch here. Take your right hand. Hold it straight out like this, okay? Now we'll wrap it around. Pack yourself in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming today.